And so, and so as we continue on to hair, some simple terms to address first. When we are looking at an entire hair, there is going to be a portion that's going to be visible. It's going to be an exposed part of the hair. This is going to be referred to as the hair shaft. The portion that is embedded into the dermis and further into the epidermis as well, but also the dermis, is going to be the hair root, or really the non-exposed part of hair. And so we have our hair shaft to worry about. Again, exposed part. Hair root, the part that's embedded into the dermis. And then if we go all the way down to the base of a hair, what you'll notice are a few things. That as we're making our way, the whole entire thing is sectioned off so you can see individual parts, right? You can see the inside the hair. You can see these cells around it and a connective tissue on top. And so we make our way down, the most superficial thing we see is this large bulb. This is referred to as a hair bulb. And that same hair bulb has a sheath around it. You may have heard the word follicle before. Sometimes if you pull out a hair and you see that little bit of white that comes out with it, right? That little bit of white is going to be your connective tissue sheath that wraps around the hair. And this has always been a little troublesome to understand, but easily, it's like when you think about a, like a ninja or some sort of warrior movie and there's like a sword, right? And they have it inside of their little carrying case and then they, you know, take it out all cool-like. That is a sheath. That's what a sheath is. So it's like a sword is stored inside of its container, the sheath. And so this is the same thing. A hair is sheathed inside of a tissue sheath. We typically call it a follicle. And simply, it's just the container of hair. But of note is that it has that bulbish region at the very bottom, which is a very important site. You're going to see that each hair is going to have a root hair plexus, which is going to be a little bit of nerve cell. And these nerve cells are gonna connect to it and that's why it hurts when you move it. Some organisms, that hurts when you pull it, sorry. And some organisms, they have the capability or very advanced nerve endings attached to their hairs that are called whiskers. And so cats and dogs, you'll notice that they sort of feel the word, world like if those were fingertips. As they're navigating and smelling through things, they're not really bumping their nose against everything because they're using them like fingertips. And so they are, in, in essence, used differently in different animals. We're going to see hair-like structures as a trend, even for us, for nerves, a little bit uh, further down the line. And as we make our way, our rector pili muscles, as we saw in our earlier part of the lecture, is that smooth muscle. It's a muscle that causes our goosebumps. It causes the hair to become erect. And sebaceous glands are going to be what we can simply call right now until we get to it on our notes. It's going to be our hair glands. We can think about it simply. And their job is to maintain hair, coat hair, and the skin surface. And looking at our little photo here, we can see a little bit of these hair oils will be secreted. We call this hair oil sebum. 
and we'll talk about that in the next slide, but sebum goes out to coat hair, and also it can coat the surface if it comes out, or there are also glands that just go directly that are sebaceous, that secrete sebum, sebum fluid of oil, pardon, directly onto the surface. But we'll see that on the next slide. And so if we take a closer look at what's going on in this bulb, you can already see, again, our nerve is there. We can also see blood supply is innervating that area. And so if we remove those tissues or that surface on top, we can see inside and what we see is this little bit of connective tissue. This little bit of connective tissue brings in an artery and a little vein. And so they are capable of distributing or bringing nutrients, bringing oxygen, because at the end of, oh, sorry, let me finish this. This little nub of tissue is called the hair papilla. And remember, papilla in Latin means nipple shape. And so this is a little papilla inside. Now, the good news is, is that if we've understood our epidermis and that we have basal cells, then understanding the rest isn't that more complicated. When you think about the epidermis, and I'll step back a second to remind us all, that we had a layer of cells, the first layer called stratum basal. And stratum basal were stem cells called basal cells, and they give rise to all the keratinocytes through mitosis, and then all of these other keratinocytes migrate to become keratinized and die on the surface. And so these cells are basal cells. And so it's no different in hair. When we look at hair, the hair matrix is special because this area is going to possess a bunch of basal cells. And the cells that create hair are actually called keratinocytes too. So your hair and your epidermis are essentially made from the same type of cell. They are slightly different, related very closely, but they are at the end keratinocytes. And so basal cells, same thing. In the matrix, all the way leading all the way up to here, you have mitotically active cells. And they are going to produce keratinocytes that are going to travel towards the exterior world, the superficial world, right to the surface, and also to the outer edges of hair. And so that's what the hair matrix is known for, for actively having active dividing basal cells. And remember, basal cells are keratinocyte stem cells that are therefore undergoing mitosis in that hair matrix. And I mentioned earlier that medulla and cortex are not words that we're going to be able to get away from. Medulla will always mean the center region of something, and the cortex will always mean the outer region of something. And honestly, this word cortex, when I say outer, it means relative to the medulla. You're going to see that right now. There is going to be a more superficial structure called the cuticle. It's the most on the surface layer. But cortex and medulla are related words. Usually you're using these two in one to show a relationship to each other. And so medulla is going to be the inner layer. The cortex will always be the outer layer of the medulla. And so when we examine our photo, we can see, again, medulla compared to the cortex will be the more centralized area. And that's going to be where all the daughter cells of those basal cells will migrate and stay in that medulla, daughter cells. Some of the daughter cells will make their way out to the cortex, which will be an even more outer layer compared to the medulla. And so one more layer out. That's all it is. And finally, the cuticle. The cells, the daughter cells that are made very close to the edge here of the matrix, they eventually make their way all the way to the very surface. And these are referred to as just the same type of keratinocytes, but the hairs that are on the surface are called cuticle because they're the ones that are visible. When you look at a hair, you, take, you pluck a hair and you just look simply at it, you are looking at the cuticle of the hair. You are looking at the surface of the hair. 
And that's all a cuticle is. And then cuticle, most superficial layer. And here, what we should know, we don't need to know any lengthy definitions. Here, what we need to know is gross anatomy. The gross anatomy means, actually, technically, this isn't gross anatomy anymore. We have to know just simply where these structures fit in bold. Structures in bold. Sorry about that. Structures in bold. Be able to ID on these photos. Simple enough. Be able to ID. And the same thing goes for our nails. Just be able to ID or know the gross anatomy. Now it actually does apply. Gross anatomy always meant looking or structures that you can typically see without a microscope. And so the gross anatomy in our case is going to be just know where the terms fit, the ones that are in bold below. So let's start from the bottom, and then I'll help you with these labels up here. First, we have the nail body. The nail body is going to refer to the entire nail. You can see that if we look at a superficial direction, the nail body sits right on top. So the nail body is the actual nail itself. And you can see that it sits on a little layer of epidermis. And it sits on a little on the layer of dermis, both the papillary layer and the reticular layer. And so the body lies on the bed. The bed is simply just the epidermis underneath. And so the nail body, another way of thinking about it, it's the visible surface of the nail. If you were to go to the very edges of it, you can see that you can see these tiny little indentations, this groove in the corners. That's going to be our lateral nail groove. And then the skin that makes the boundary is going to be called the lateral nail fold. So the brown part is the nail fold. The brown part is the nail fold, or it's the skin. This is like pure stratum corneum up here. And so seen from a different perspective, I kind of drew it in myself here, where you have all these little dark lines, this groove in between is going to be a groove. And so this one's going to be called your lateral nail groove if it's found on the lateral ends of the nail. The fold is the skin on the, that makes that outer boundary, the lateral boundary. we can then see another groove. Remember that if we're traveling down the digit towards the end of it, we are traveling in a distal direction. If we are traveling in this direction, it's proximal. And so technically, this fold here is gonna be on our proximal, or be our proximal nail groove, right? If you're thinking about this edge, this is the distal edge, this is the proximal edge of the nail. And so our proximal nail groove and then you probably guess what the layer of skin nearby is. It's going to be our proximal nail fold. A play off of the same words. This little crescent moon object here is our lanula. And it's a little bit of visible basal cells. Even your nails are made from keratinocytes. They're just slightly different. 
They're exactly like the skin ones, except the protein they produce is way tougher and more concentrated. But otherwise, they are almost identical to our keratinocytes on our skin. And then the last one to add, we might have heard of the word cuticle. A lot of the times you might see some skin growing up, covering this little moon. And typically it's pushed down for cosmetic reasons. But that little bit of skin that sits on top is called the hyponychium, like Nike, Nikeum. And we know it on our day-to-day -day talk as the cuticle, hyponychium. And then lastly, the distal end is called the free edge, the free edge. And it is the direction of growth. It grows towards the free edge in a distal direction. And now the nail is produced in something referred to as the nail root. And so when we examine the nail root, the nail root can be seen on this photo. When we take a look, make a lateral section of the finger here, you can see that the nail is embedded inside of the visible portion, right? Here's our lanula, that little visible crescent moon. And the hyponychium is going to be the skin on top, but deep inside of that skin lies your nail root. And again, a root, just like a hair root, is the non-exposed portion of nail. And this is going to be also the site where the, the nail is produced. The last thing to add, where we have our hyponychium, which once more is our cuticle, we have our hyponychium, which is going to be a bit of hard stratum corneum found underneath the free edge. And that can be found right above it, area thickened stratum corneum under the free edge. And then I rewrote nail bed in a different, from a different perspective, nail body as well, and free edge, so you can see it a little differently. And that's all we gotta know here, is know these terms in bold on the figures that you're seeing here. And now for tissue repair. Now, our tissue repair can be summed up in four stages. Inflammatory phase, migratory phase, proliferation, and scarring phase. And so starting with inflammatory phase, and quick reminders, that up here is made out of stratified squamous where the keratinocytes reign or dominate, or they're the main cell there. And then below here, you have your papillary layer made out of areolar tissue. And then you have your reticular layer, which is going to be made out of irregular, giving it that stretchiness. And lastly, we have our hypodermis, which contains adipose. Now, the relevant thing to talk about here is that if you have an injury, something that, again, that now we get to really talk about a little bit more, was when we talked about areolar tissue, we talked again a lot about cells that we kind of got to overlook. We just classified them as white blood cells. But now there was one that we have to mention here we have our mast cells and the fixed or just macrophages. And melanocytes, we know what they do. They produce pigment for the epidermal cells, right, to protect us from sunlight. But these two now are going to come up on this segment. Now, macrophages, as far as you're concerned right now, they are just white blood cells, and they'll be on the page that you're on, so don't worry. And then mast cells, what they're responsible for is causing inflammation. So the first thing that this inflammatory phase is characterized by is that we have mast cells that cause inflammation. 
they do so by releasing something called histamine. Does anybody know a drug that sounds familiar, what we take it for? Antihistamines. Anti That'll come up later, later. And so, when mast cells release histamine, they cause inflammation. And as far as inflammation goes, when we get to cardiovascular, we'll explore it more in detail. But right now, what's easy to understand about it is that we know what blood vessels are, simply. And they are capable of expanding or closing. In other words, if you have a circle, a pathway, when it's small, it's constricted. When it's large, when it opens up, it dilates, right? When your pupils dilate, it means that the, they are getting larger. And so when blood vessels dilate, this is a result of inflammation sometimes. And this is because we need a lot of bleeding. We know blood carries all the nutrients that we need to build cells, all the nutrients we need to nourish cells. And so we need a lot of bleeding there. Next, the migration phase. This is going to be characterized by the formation of a scab, right? We have a lot of bleeding now, inflammation. So a lot of blood poured into the site. And then you can see our scab begins to form. Now our new cells here are little macrophages, which right now we know only as white blood cells. And we're going to explore them more later when we talk about blood. But otherwise, all they do is that they go and search for pathogens and destroy them by swallowing them and destroying them with their lysosomes. And so they can also do, remove things that are inorganic, like dirt, dust, anything that just gets, well, not technically dust all the time, but just some things that enter into the wound, they can get rid of it. And so that's their job. Their job is to destroy pathogens and remove debris. And then finally, another thing that characterizes this step is that you'll notice that the scab is within all the way almost to the hypodermis. And the epidermis begins up here. But what it does is that the stratum basal recognizes this scab and then decides to send basal cells all the way to round and surround the entire scab so that it can rebuild the epidermis that was eventually lost. And so that's the third thing that characterizes it here. And so rapid cell division of keratinocyte basal cells that migrate along the wound edges. And then all of this, as they start, all the fibroblasts begin to rebuild all the collagen fiber that belongs here. It rebuilds it in a different way a very granulated, tough way, this will eventually become your scar. It never repairs it the way that it used to be. It'll repair it in a brand new way, a tougher way, a different way. We call that granulation tissue, which will eventually become your scar. And so we can see those very things highlighted here. It forms our, sc our scab, which is a blood clot, the cells of the stratum basal, which remember are part of the epidermis, the basal cells, will migrate along the edges of the wound. And in the meantime, the white blood cells swimming within that blood clot will be removing pathogens and debris. And granulation tissue is just a side result of the repair process. It's a remnant of it. It never repairs it exactly the same. Granulation tissue, you can consider it as scarring. And then our third phase, proliferation phase. The only thing we got to add here is that we think logically now we have to repair a dermis. There are no keratinocytes in the dermis. There are fibroblasts that are supposed to be dominating the dermis, making areolar tissue or irregular. And so they are going to lay down the collagen and the tissue fluid that they need to stay alive to restoring the dermis. That's their function, to restore the dermis when they are in the proliferation phase. 
And you can even see now that our scab has completely enveloped our wound. And so we migrate to our photo here. You can see again that our dermis is being repaired by our fibroblast, restoring the dermis. And our epidermis is undermining the scab, meaning that it's simply below the scab. It's sort of maintaining this bottom end of the scab. And the scab is slowly disappearing, slowly disappearing, and the epidermis is continuous now with the epidermis on top. So here we can see our scab has been undermined by the migrating epidermal cells. And then lastly, for our scarring phase, that granulated tissue ends up becoming just inflexible, non-cellular material, fibrous with a little bit of collagen in there. It just doesn't repair the same. Think of it simply, scarring phase leaves behind a scar, which is a visible remnant of the repair process. That's how I'm going to phrase it here. A visible remnant. If you're not sure what this word means, it means like a memory of it, like an event that occurred of healing process. And then to finish up our slides, all we got is glands left. Oh, sorry, sorry, keep, keep writing, sorry. Some of you still writing. And now as we make our way to glands, when we look at our glands, we have three types of glands to consider. We have one, our sebaceous glands. These are going to be the ones that I've been in a way, jokingly calling them hair glands to kind of help you start learning where they belong. And what they do is that they secrete an oily fluid, sorry, an oily lipid fluid called sebum, which I guess oily and lipid is oxymoronic. No, not oxymoronic, it's the same thing. So sebum is an oily or a very lipid containing substance, fluid. And a lot of the times, remember that our rector pili are linked to hairs. And so when they contract to cause goosebumps, they also, in a way, squeeze these glands to release sebum. And sebum, if we look at it with our photo, well, not the right area. When you look at our photo, you can see our sebaceous gland. It secretes sebum, and it has a very close proximity to the erector pili muscles. And so when they squeeze, they release sebum onto the hair. And this is where you have a location of cuboidal cells. Cuboidal cells will secrete sebum onto the hair. And overall, what sebum contains is triglycerides, which is a component. You learned it as fatty acids, lipids. It's just a biochemistry way of referring to fatty acids. And then it contains cholesterol, which, remember, helps to stiffen the plasma membrane. And then it also contains proteins and electrolytes. And I don't need you to know the components of sebum. I just need, to, need you to know that sebum comes from the sebaceous glands. I just put it in there for, so that your notes are nice and complete. And the function of sebum that we should know, it lubricates the hair shaft. Remember, that's the exposed part of hair. And it has antimicrobial activity. It prevents the growth of bacteria. And so we make our way now to the apocrine sweat glands. This A sort of sounds like armpit in a way, right? The two letters, armpit. Let this remind you that these glands are found in sensitive or I should say uh, normal body hair areas like say the axilla, which remember this is a plural word for axillary for armpit. So it's found in the armpits. It's found around 
the nipples, and it's found in the pubic regions. Again, I say sensitive areas, right? And the ap apocrine glands, they secrete something that's a little bit different, almost very similar, really not that much more different from sebum. But at the end of the day, what it has or why it becomes odorous is because this one doesn't necessarily have too much or the ability to suppress all anti of bacteria. It's not entirely antimicrobial. And so BO overall is bacteria that are eating that fluid secretion by those glands. And then bacteria get a little smelly when they replicate in abundance. And then so that smell is sort of a combination of, yeah, an oily substance, a lipid substance, but also a little bit of bacteria that are consuming it and growing in those areas. And this is strongly influenced by hormones. That's why, right, you see during um, teenagers tend to be a little bit stinkier. And then this comes up a little bit later, but if you hear ceremonious glands, these are talking about earwax, even earwax is a variation of this, but we'll talk about this way later. And apocrine sweat glands tend to have some sort of chemical signaling abilities in a lot of animals. And even with us, technically, there's been some evidence that you typically find the, like, you can be attracted to someone based off of their odors. And maybe we're reading levels of health or some things that we're recognizing in smell that we really haven't known, but that's not really well understood. And I guess that's really the only thing to add there. And then the eccrine, merocrine sweat, merocrine sweat glands, what these are, they're the traditional glands that we know as sweat glands. So, very quickly, our first line here under sweat glands, we see secrete directly onto the surface of skin, putting a special emphasis on directly. If we look at our photos, you can see that when we compare our apocrine gland, it is also linked to a hair, but you can see that it has a body where all the cuboidal cells are secreting through the duct and then the hair, and the sebaceous glands, well, sebaceous glands, well, I'm keeping on the wrong side here, they are linked directly onto the hair. Big difference, a oh, big difference between the two. But remember, these are only located in those sensitive areas. And the sweat pore directly excretes blood, secretes blood onto the surface of skin. And this sweat will contain water and electrolytes. And remember, the word salts and ions is the same word as electrolytes. That's why sweat is a little salty, right? And it'll be important in thermoregulation, regulating temperature. And in our case, in this case, when it secretes, it's cooling your body down when temperatures are high. 